today on All Rights Reserved. Why do you think copyright laws were created? Um, just to make sure that everyone gets uh, recognition for what they wrote so you're not stealing anybody else's work. That means that if someone posted copyright infringing material to Tumblr, for instance, without the DMCA, Tumblr could be held liable for copyright infringement. However, the DMCA establishes safe harbor for service providers as long as certain conditions are met. DRM, digital rights management, is something that game makers have been using lately. I know to prevent them from copying the game and putting it out in the torrent for people to download it for free. Copyright, 1790, the encouragement of learning. That was its sole purpose then. Does it seem like we've strayed? How do we go from encouraging learning to protecting rights of creators? How does ensuring profitability promote progress? Copyright should be balanced, both creators and users, but it's not anymore. This is All Rights Reserved, a podcast advocating for true copyright reform. podcast where obsolete video formats and the Streisand effect have any relevance. I'm your host, Rico Robbins. In case any of you aren't familiar with the term the Streisand effect, the Streisand effect occurs when an attempt to cover up information actually instead makes the information more widespread than before. The lyrics to that Creative Commons song, O9 F9 was once attempted to be removed from the internet by the MPAA. You probably are thinking, how and why? Well, how is simple. They used the notice and take them procedure laid out in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, to remove the content from defunct site aggregator DIG. The DMCA's notice and takedown procedure will be explored later in today's episode. But as to the answer to why they wanted it removed, well, that requires a bit more of a technical explanation. 09F9 begins the hexadecimal sequence used in a key to decrypt copy protected HD DVDs. You know, those souped up DVD discs with HD content that were phased out by Blu-ray discs? Now, make no mistake, a copy protected DVD and a copyrighted DVD are not interchangeable terms. If a disc is copy protected, then it uses a type of DRM or digital rights management to prevent people from accessing the content of the disc unless it's in a quote-unquote licensed player. The idea behind this is that without the proper decryption, the DRM on the disc will prevent it from being accessed by anything other than a media player, including the ability to copy it to your computer's hard drive, for example. The MPAA claims that DRM is used to prevent piracy online. Does it really? And, to make matters worse, bypassing DRM, even if it's for a legal, non-infringing activity, is also illegal 
under a different clause of the DMCA. This may not seem like a big deal at first, but it also brings copyright laws into issues where it shouldn't even belong. However, before we discuss this more, and why this is one of the more flawed parts of existing U.S. copyright law, let's see what other peers know about DRM and the reason why copyright laws were even created in the first place. Oh, believe me, that is beyond relevant. What is digital rights management? Not sure. Um... Um... I'm not sure what the digital rights management is. I don't know anything about the digital rights management. DRM, digital rights management, is something that game makers have been using lately. I know to prevent them from copying the game and putting it on the torrent for people to download for free. Do you have any idea what that is? Not really. <laughs> Can you explain it a little bit, or...? Well, sort of. It's, it's sort of like if you download something on iTunes, like a movie, then uh, it comes with something called Digital Rights Management, or DRM. It's essentially software with the movie that makes sure that you don't, like, copy it or do anything okay. legal with it. Okay. So, uh... Why do you think copyright laws were created? Um, I think they were created to, uh, I, get, I guess, give credit to the person who's actually getting the information and who's taking the picture. I mean, I don't think it's very fair for somebody to take another person's material and use it as their own when that person went through the trouble and hard work of getting them getting it themselves. So, I mean, I guess that's why it was used. I mean, me personally, I think that's why they created it. I guess I should say. I think copyright laws were created in order to protect the seller and the creator themselves. Why are copyright laws created? Um, just to make sure that everyone gets uh, recognition for what they wrote so you're not stealing anybody else's work. Um, I believe the copyright laws were created so that um, people just don't steal other people's ideas and just make it their own. So it gives people their, um, it gives them their ownership to it. Um, copyright laws were created so you can't steal or use other people's work without having to, uh, or I was claiming it as your own instead of giving the credit where it's rightfully needed. Now, if you listen to my podcast intro, you'd know that under the original U.S. copyright law, known as the Copyright Act of 1790, its purpose was stated to be the encouragement of learning. However, there is a much deeper purpose. And no, it's not to give credit to anybody. In order for Congress to pass any law, it must first fall under a power bestowed to them under the U.S. Constitution. And there is, in fact, a clause known as the Copyright Clause that gives Congress the ability to make laws that affect, quote-unquote, intellectual property. That clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, states that Congress shall have the power to, and I quote, promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. The key here is that it's to promote progress, not to give credit when it is due, not to make sure people can make money off of their work, but to promote progress. How does copyright law promote progress? Well, consider this. What if there was a world with 
no copyright laws whatsoever. What would be the real reason why content creators wouldn't, well, create content? Suppose I spend time with co-writers writing a new song to record. I pay two other authors, not to mention studio time, just putting my heart and soul into this one song. Now suppose a mischievous family member grabs the demo of that song and releases a cover of that song before I even release that original song publicly. Sure, they may have to pay for studio time, but they wouldn't have to pay the co-writers or me anything for writing the song. They could then, in turn, make a larger profit from my original song than anything I could ever make. Therefore, without copyright, copies of works couldn't compete with the original fairly. If original works couldn't compete with copies, the Founding Fathers thought that eventually, no one would have an incentive to create new content and the so-called public domain wouldn't thrive. And eventually, progress would be slowed to a standstill as there would be no way to compete against copies. Now, imagine the same logic but with research into a scientific paper. Or even a world without patents and the same thing happening with an invention. Without these sorts of laws, there would be no incentive for anyone to create anything. But with laws like copyright and patent laws, all that goes away. The idea of a limited monopoly that gives people like me the exclusive right to use my song, paper, or invention prevents that mischievous family member from making a highly competitive and more profitable copy of my own work. However, our founding fathers didn't want this monopoly to last forever. Otherwise, it would be a way for government to control what you can and can't say. Copyright would then be violating free speech rights, thus making it unconstitutional. Therefore, to ensure that the public domain would also thrive, they limited the monopoly of these rights severely. First, you had to be a U.S. citizen. That's right. In the beginning of our country, foreign works didn't have any copyright status, and we did not recognize copyrights of other nations. So, right off the bat, you could say that we were a nation of pirates, fostering book piracy from authors across the pond. Second, you had to register your work with the Copyright Office a part of the Library of Congress. It's important to note that registration is still around today, but it is not a requirement for something to have copyright protection. Registration, however, is needed if you plan to sue for copyright infringement, and in order for that infringement to backdate, it needs to have been registered within three months of its first publication. But back then, Without registration or even a copyright notice, it was automatically in the public domain. Finally, copyrights only lasted for a limited amount of time. Back then, copyright only lasted for 14 years, with the possibility for it to be renewed for an additional 14 years, making the total 28 years of copyright protection. However, you cannot renew copyright works anymore, and that is with good cause. Copyright now lasts a lifetime, plus 70 years. So, for a long time after the author is long dead, the owners of their estate is still the copyright holder. This may seem well intended, but think about it. Today, the only time you can be certain something is in the public domain based on the passage of time alone is if it was published in 1922 or earlier. But even then, for a long time, Warner Chapel Music claimed to own the copyright to the song Happy Birthday to You, and anyone wanting to make money out of it 
or perform it in a public venue required you to pay royalties to Warner. However, they recently made the news that a court struck down this ridiculous claim. While the judge didn't rule that Happy Birthday was in the public domain, he did state that Warner had no copyright interest in the song Happy Birthday. At most, they only had copyright protection to one arrangement of the song, but not anything else. Yet, chances are that even if there was a copyright holder to Happy Birthday who sought royalties, they would have come forward a long time ago, especially considering that Warner was making an average $5,000 per day off of royalties alone. That equals $1.8 million per year. But enough of the public domain. However, one thing that should be taken away from all this is that copyright at the end of the day, it's designed to serve society's interests as opposed to serve creators of content by rewarding them for their hard work. So, let's take a look at the flawed piece of legislation known as the DMCA. There are a lot of things that change copyright law in the DMCA, which stands for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. However, the two most common parts are the sections of safe harbor provisions, which establishes the notice and takedown procedures of online service providers, and the anti circumvention provisions, which is usually the most contested part of the law. Passed in 1998 and signed by President Bill Clinton, the DMCA is probably the most recently passed legislation that affects copyright law the most today. When it comes to the notice and takedown provisions, there's actually little I can test with, so long as the law is done right. Before the DMCA became law, any party, including online service providers, such as Google, Tumblr, or any other site which allows its users to post content to the site, could be held liable for contributory copyright infringement. That means that if someone posted copyright infringing material to Tumblr, for instance, without the DMCA, Tumblr could be held liable for copyright infringement. However, the DMCA establishes safe harbor for service providers as long as certain conditions are met. First, they must be unaware of any copyright infringement occurring on their services. Second, they must adhere to the notice and takedown procedure when it comes to removing infringing content from their site. And finally, if one user is found to be a repeat infringer, they must have some type of policy in place where the user's account is deleted and banned from their service. Notice and takedown procedure is simple. If a copyright holder finds a post on a DMCA compliant site that infringes their copyright, the DMCA allows them to send to the site what's called a takedown notice. The site, once receiving this legal notice, must respond as soon as possible to remove or block the content in question from being accessed and notify the user who posted the material that their post was removed due to a copyright claim. However, copyright holders don't just have the right to remove whatever content they wish with this law. There are two ways of getting past this if the post in question is not infringing, such as if it was a mistake on their part, the content was posted with license permission, or if the use of the content was a fair use. The first way is a DMCA counter notice. The user has the right to send this to the site if they think it was removed as a result of a mistake or misidentification. The site must then pass along 
this notice to the copyright holder. From there, the copyright holder has to file a lawsuit seeking a court order injunction to prevent that content from being restored. Otherwise, unless the site hears that the copyright holder has filed a lawsuit, the site must restore the content within 10 to 14 business days. Another way laid out in the DMCA is that if the copyright holder has represented the copyright claim on that content, they can be found liable in a civil suit for what's called misrepresentation under the DMCA. Like I said, I have no problems with this part of the law. It allows due process to make sure neither copyright holders nor users have a bigger interest in copyright issues, all while shifting liability away from sites that comply with the DMCA. However, if the DMCA is abused so that it does not allow fair use of material online, or if the site does not respond to all proper counter notices effectively, that's when I say problems arise. However, the other part of the DMCA, the anti-circumvention provisions, is not just a major problem, but it's also not even necessary. The DMCA says it's illegal to circumvent any technological measures that is used to, and I quote, prevent unauthorized access to copyrighted works, including copyrighted books, movies, videos, video games, or computer programs. First off, the wording of the definition of a technological protection measure is especially concerning. The right to access is not an exclusive right of the copyright holder. Furthermore, I could argue that a control of a right to access a copyrighted work is not in the best interest of the public. Access to information is meant to flourish and not be limited under copyright law. Second, keep in mind that anti-circumvention is not a form of copyright infringement. In fact, even if what you are doing does not infringe copyright, but you still circumvent a technological measure, you still broke the law. But it doesn't stop there. The distribution of tools that circumvent technological measures, including ones that have non-infringing uses, are also banned under this part of the law. For example, consider macrovision. It's a form of a technological protection measure that works on analog video systems, VHS, DVDs, and even Blu-ray movies employ this technology that has been around since the 1980s. Without getting too technical, just know that this technology causes playback on a TV to work just fine. But if you hook up another VCR to record a copy of it, it will distort the picture of that copy to make the movie unviewable. The technological workings of Macrovision are required to be detected in all VCRs and DVD recorders under the DMCA since 2002. DVD recorders, though, react differently than VCRs to Macrovision encoded video. Since DVDs are 100% digital, if a DVD recorder detects that you are recording a Macrovision encoded signal, it will display a message saying that the signal is copy protected and abruptly stop the recording. Normally, this wouldn't be a problem, but because of the way Macrovision works, sometimes old, shaky home movies recorded by your family can trigger DVD recorder's Macrovision detector and stop recording, even though there is no Macrovision on such tapes. I know this not just from research, but from first-hand experience. However, the good news is that there is a device known as a video stabilizer that can fix the issue. But the bad news is 
that this also can be used to circumvent macrovision. So the distribution and use of these items are illegal under the DMCA. However, there are exceptions to the anti-circumvention law. There is no statutory exception that allows you to circumvent a technological protection measure for fair use purposes. However, there is an exception that is just renewed for that very purpose, assuming that you are breaking DRM from a DVD, Blu-ray, or online video service. You see, the DMCA allows the Library of Congress to make rules every three years that are exempt from this blanket anti-circumvention law. However, those rules only last for those three years. And if they aren't renewed, the circumvention of technological measures for that purpose is once again illegal. Furthermore, exceptions made by the law of of Congress do not extend to the ban for distributing tools used for anti circumvention. But since when does that make sense? Now everyone seeking to circumvent technological measures has your technical know-how on how to do it. Furthermore, most of today's DRM standards are secretive in nature. If someone can gain information on how a technological measure works, it usually would fall under some type of non-disclosure agreement. Most ways DRM is circumvented is through some type of hack, and those hacks are then distributed in tools tools that are illegal under the DMCA. That poses the biggest problem with DRM and technological measures. Hackers won't give up and will always find ways to break DRM. A computer security expert in a TED talk once said something about hackers that I think also applies here. He said along the lines that when you are trying to build a secure infrastructure. You need to find all the weaknesses in the infrastructure that someone could try to exploit and then cover them up as quickly as possible. However, a hacker needs to only find one weakness to exploit. So, the good guys have an infinite amount of weaknesses to find, but the bad guys only need to find one. The odds are stacked against them right from the get-go. And the same is true for DRM. DRM will never be 100% perfect. DRM can even be said to promote rather than discourage piracy. Consider a commonly proposed suggestion that has always been rejected by the Library of Congress. An exception allowing you to circumvent technological measures to format shift and or spaceship copyrighted videos on Blu-rays, DVDs, or online services. Here's what this means. Suppose you have a DVD encrypted by its DRM standard, the Content Scrambling System, or CSS. Bypassing CSS for any purpose will normally be illegal under the DMCA. Proposed exception allow someone to bypass CSS through a digital copy on your computer's hard drive and even transfer it to your phone, so long as the copy is made from a DVD that you legally purchased. This time it was proposed, the Library of Congress rejected this exception, stating that services like Voodoo would allow you to do a similar thing without the need to circumvent CSS. However, Voodoo is a paid service. Here's another thing. Suppose you have an Android tablet, a Windows computer, and an iPhone, plus the desire for at least one DVD copy. Without this rule, bypassing DRM on any legally purchased copy transferred from one format to another is illegal. Even though each device needs a different format, and you aren't really infringing copyright by doing so. Voodoo only works 
by select devices. And while the iPad is included, the iPhone is not. Voodoo works for more entertainment and video game systems than anything else. You would likely need to buy a copy of the movie that works for each device. So to buy, say, Despicable Me 2. That's $13 from Walmart on DVD, $20 for iTunes on your iPhone, $13 on Google Play, and $15 from the Microsoft Store. Bringing you a grand total of $61 plus tax for one movie. Why pay over $60 for four copies of one movie for each of your devices when you can get one interchangeable copy of the same movie for absolutely nothing? Yes, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but that's really the logic. Before you say, hey, I just want to make money, consider this. Music used to be protected with DOM and purchased online too. Steve Jobs then wrote an open letter to the music industry called Thoughts on Music, where he expressed a vision of a music industry where you didn't have to buy any music with DRM, regardless of what store you bought it from. You could buy music from any store, and it would be interchangeable from device to device, all free of DRM. He even had strong arguments as for why, too, such as CDs already being DRM free, and an alternative of opening iTunes DRM for other platforms, causing the potential for leaks of the inner workings of Apple's DRM system, known as Fair Play. Apple shortly got its wish. All major music labels at the time decided to drop the requirement for DRM in its online retailers. Starting then, music piracy rates actually declined when streaming services like Spotify and Apple Music opened up, music piracy rates declined even more. Streaming services like Spotify really could only begin to be thought of when music went there on free. However, the major movie studios are still digging their heels in DRM, saying it's absolutely necessary to stop piracy online. But the truth is, DRM and its draconian laws that enforce it is ineffective at stopping piracy. The music industry shows that piracy isn't a legal problem, but a business problem. By giving a better service than the pirates, piracy will go down and will eventually be phased out. All DRM does is force consumers to pay more to the studios. And laws like the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA only are good when there is actual copyright infringement. But if that's the case, why don't there be double jeopardy? Isn't being guilty of copyright infringement enough for the crime? Anti-circumvention is just a bad law. And it's not just piracy that is an issue with anti-circumvention either. And this convention opens the door to bring copyright law into areas it shouldn't even be concerned with. The DMCA has been used to prevent people from modifying car software to repair them or make them more fuel efficient. An exception for this was recently added also, but the EPA and the DOT recently came out against the exception when the Library of Congress was considering it stating that it would enable people to break safety checks and even harm the environment. But since when does copyright law have to be concerned about what could or could not harm the environment? Another example is drinking an iPhone, which used to be considered a major problem with the DMCA until an exception was renewed for it in the Library of Congress. In fact, Apple is notorious using the DMCA to enforce its policies. For instance, 
Another issue when the DMC is involved in Apple's business is something known as Hackintoshing. A Hackintosh is a regular non-Apple PC running OS X, the operating system used on Macs. Ever since Apple began to transition their Mac computers to Intel processors, people became interested in running OS X on PC hardware. Apple contends that installing OS X on non Apple labeled hardware is illegal under the anti circumvention provisions of the DMCA. Keep in mind that even if the DMCA isn't an issue, it does violate Apple's end user license agreement. You know, that EULA thing that everyone agrees to when installing a program but doesn't ever bother to read? But all that a EULA truly does is open up a contract between you and the software developer. Breaking the EULA does not automatically constitute copyright infringement. However, I will admit, early on in the days of Hackintoshing, the only way to install OS X on a PC required you to patch a leaked, pirated copy of a developer version of Mac OS X Tiger. Even when OS X could be patched with existing installed disks, some people made available for download pre-patched installed DVDs dubbed as OS x86 distros. These especially became prevalent in the wake of the release of OS X Leopard as Mac OS X Leopard required a lot more patches that were even more hard to apply. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. The early days of Hackintoshing required piracy. However, it didn't stay that way forever. An Apple developer named David Elliott, who also was involved in the Hackintosh community, developed a modified version of an open source Apple bootloader known as Boot132. Boot132, with David Elliott's modifications, allowed someone with a PC with close to Apple hardware to boot the original unmodified retail install DVD. Someone without close to Apple hardware might need a few more modifications to the bootloader or even a few additional drivers to get it 100% up and running. But in the end, no patches were required to run OS X on PC hardware. Some PC users today use another bootloader that is based off of David's modified boot with its two software to install and run OS X on their own PCs. However, even though people were legally purchasing OS X at the time, Apple still contested that this was in violation of the DMCA. However, it's important to note that as of OS X Mavericks, people can download OS X for free from the Mac App Store. However, this ideology opens up the grounds for more murky waters in buying digital versions of copyrighted content, including software. This easily could mean that whenever you buy something online that is copyrighted, you don't own a copy of it, you merely have a license to use the content or software the way the copyright holder sees it. This would mean buying a DVD is only buying a license to use the DVD to play the movie for private use. Buying a song on iTunes means you only have a license to listen to the song privately. Once more, EULAs can then be used to constitute copyright infringement and violations of the anti-circumvent provisions of the DMCA to enforce their terms on the software lest the user face criminal charges or civil damages. Copyright was designed to promote progress, but instead it's being used to enforce corporations' terms and conditions. Even when those terms and conditions have little to do with copyright and everything to do with profit. Yet, 
I think it's time for our second voices to step in here. But unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond my control, I am unable to play my roundtable discussion here like I usually would. The copy I made of the roundtable discussion is on a USB flash drive with a USB plug snapped off. However, I do have a backup copy, but I will not be able to access that backup until after my deadline for this episode. However, as next week's topic is a bit shorter than these past ones, I will play the roundtable discussion from this episode first thing next episode. Sorry about this, but this technical difficulty is beyond my control. So, look forward to that next time. However, before I close, I do wish to say something about the term intellectual property, as I alluded to in the previous episode. Copyrights and patents fall under the term intellectual property. However, I am personally not a fan of that term. We have a right to protect our physical property, and if someone steals something of ours, we have encountered an actual loss of property we once had. However, if someone illegally downloads something online or infringes copyright another way, morals and laws aside, they still own the copyright and they aren't deprived of anything. The copyright holder only lost potential revenue, not any actual revenue they already have. The term intellectual property also paints the picture that copyrights need to be protected in a territorial manner, even though ideas overlap. I asked Caitlin Wren and Seth Ronnie about this in our roundtable discussion for this episode, so be sure to tune in next week to catch their response. Well, that's it for today's episode of All Rights Reserved. Be sure to join us next time for the roundtable discussion on anti-circumvention as well as a discussion on an even darker proposed bill to regulate copyright infringement online. Also, we'll even learn about a real-life conspiracy theory that could drastically change how you look at online piracy. You don't want to miss next week for that epic episode. Until then, see you next time.